Welcome. This is another class of the Human Attachment Project, and it's a project of birthing the future, the nonprofit that I was urged to start many years ago. And I'm very excited to have you here today. This class is going to focus on babies, bonding, and the human brain. And we're going to weave in a lot of other stuff as well. The first thing that I'd like to say is that you can't really understand anything about babies if you don't understand a word that is not very common in modern vocabulary, and that word is paradox, which is a big word for saying two things that couldn't possibly be the same, mean or equal or both be true, and yet they are. So biggest paradox at the beginning with a baby is that the baby and the mother carrying the baby are two separate human beings. They have their own destiny, their own soul, their own spirit, their own whatever they came into this world with, their own genetic makeup, which has some, a lot of, to do with the mother and the father biologically, but even more. And yet they are one being. And now we're calling them the mother baby because it's understood by many people that what happens to one happens to the other and what you don't do for one, the other doesn't get either. And they directly interact. And I'll give you an example. When a baby even nuzzles the mother's breast after birth, it causes her womb, her uterus, to contract back to the size of a fist. That's why so many women bleed when they don't have the baby on the breast, the baby isn't given to them, it's not skin to skin. Baby doesn't even have to suckle, just nuzzle her breast. And at the same time, as I actually said in, the, in another class, suckling releases in the mother's body at least 19 different hormones in her gut. And we now know that the human gut is directly connected to the brain. So when you say, well, I'm thinking about it, and you pat your belly, it is true. Just as the human heart is a kind of brain that may be governing the whole body, about 87% of, of the heart cells are neural cells. They're brain cells. And we now know that how you digest food and the food you have actually directly affects how you think. So anyway, this baby just suckling at the mother's breast releases at least 19 different hormones in that mother's gut which do the following. Paradoxically, if she's obese, it will help her lose weight, including in places that nothing else will. I like to tell people this who don't want to breastfeed. Right here. That's what breastfeeding does, right? People will lose weight even there. Women who are starving will over-digest their food or hyper-digest to get every nutrient they can as a result of those hormones. That's pretty amazing. We have, and we do have a baby here today, so if you hear great baby sounds that I always like to have a baby when we're talking about babies. And this is Sonia, and she's eight and a half months old. So, Paradox is at the root of everything human, but the mother baby is probably the biggest paradox of all because they are one and yet they are two. What you do to one, you do to the other. What you forget to do and inadvertently leave out and neglect to one affects the other. Why does it matter that I'm talking about birth to a lot of adults, some of whom in this room may never have children or may already have had children and may be even beyond what they consider being caretaking of their grandchildren because their grandchildren have grown up. But you were all born. Every one of you and me were shaped by the experiences of what we call the primal continuum of human development. That's from preconception to age one. You were that baby. And I don't know if you've ever really thought about how many of the patterns in your life, the symptoms that you have in terms of bodily ailments or things that challenge you or relationship issues 
might have to do with things that were set in your brain as you were developing. And that means in the womb. That means at conception. That means at birth and then that first year afterward. And also in this what we call the sacred hour, the first hour after birth. And we humans have been messing with this for a long time. I think it's really important for you to remember that we're talking about those babies there, this Sonia here, and this baby inside you who still exists. Whose needs may have all been met or mostly been met or maybe not. An interesting thing about babies is they can only exist in relationship. <coughs> Literally, baby as a word shouldn't even be in the dictionary as a solo word. A baby cannot exist outside of a relationship. Why? It can't fend for itself. It can do a lot of things. It can creep to the breast. And within the first hour, if it's not drugged, if the mother has baby will, within an hour, find its way up to the breast, even if the mother's on a half incline, like half sitting. If you put it down here, and it will bob its head back and forth and choose the breast closest to the heart and latch on. But it can't do what other big mammals can do. And when I say a baby can only exist in relationship, I mean that. It takes a human infant at least nine months to do what most animals, big animals, you know, foals, calves can do within the first hour or two. And that is find the food source. It can do that unless it's gotten drugs from the mother, in which case it might have a hard time finding its way. Get up on its feet and flee from danger. Babies can't do that. So I want you to remember that babies can only exist in relationship, and yet we've been treating babies in strange ways for thousands of years. Good news is we're waking up to a lot of this. Second thing I want you to understand about babies is they are always communicating. Always. Right from birth. And in fact, babies have a lot of power over their birth. It's probably not accurate to say being born as if it was a passive thing. Communication. Because the baby does a great deal to birth itself. And I know of a midwife in Germany who's done more water births than any midwife in the world and does a great deal of research on it, who had a baby that she was assisting in the birth of two years later during swimming class and afterwards with the moms, um, come up to her and she was asking it something about being in mommy's tummy. And this baby, who is now two, said, well, when I was, and he searched for the right word, he couldn't, he, he wasn't born, born myself, he said. It's not, an ad, it's not a verb in German or in English. It's an active word, born myself. So people forget that, and when we introduce drugs to the mother, we introduce them to the baby, and it really, it's like having the wrong map to follow, and it makes it very difficult for the baby to do what it has to do. Every baby lives in a classroom called the mother's womb. It really is our first classroom. It's where we learn virtually everything. Every emotion, babies go through it all in the womb. And she is that baby's universe. So I want you to just close your eyes for a minute and think about yourself. Who is having been in a universe, a tight universe, was fairly loose for a while, and then it got tighter and tighter, where you got everything from your mother, including her hormones, her molecules of emotion, 
including the relationship she was in with others, particularly her partner, if she had one, father, if he was there. It all came straight to you. We used to think, and this is one of the old myths, we used to think that the placenta was like a barrier. Yeah, we did. We thought the placenta was a barrier and it stopped bad things from getting through. No, no, no. It turns out that anything of a molecular size larger than a very tiny thing can go right through. It's more like a strainer. So I like to say when women are pregnant that they're like a sieve. They take everything in. And the impact you can have on a baby simply by saying something comforting to her, that mother or something that honors that mother's experience and where she is, is huge. From conception, probably to many months after birth, but certainly the first few months. We have enormous power to shape the lives of babies. Simply by saying you look gorgeous when you do approximately, I know it's about a month, it's not really a date, you know? And that plants a little piece of information when the doctor or her mother says, I think we should have this baby induced. Babies do yesterday. No, no, actually it's a month, a month long approximate due date. But you can look her in the eyes and simply by saying, God, you look gorgeous. You're going to have a natural birth? Going to the midwife? Oh, really? Maybe you want a second opinion. You look so healthy. See what I mean? Just a few words that you just say, and I could say that lined up in the grocery store line. So one of the paradoxes of a baby is, I mentioned that it's physiologically very immature, a human baby, has to do with the size of the brain and walking upright and the fact that we have to squeeze through the pelvis. And the pelvis is smaller in relationship to the brain than a lot of animals. So. A baby is fully aware, sensitive, and conscious as it's being born and afterwards, and yet it's physiologically so immature, so premature. And that's a paradox. And I want you to think about that as you reflect on how we've talked about babies in the past, that they don't feel, they won't remember, and it doesn't make a difference. You know, and we do this, for example, in circumcision. Oh, they're not going to feel it. Oh, he can't remember it. Oh, it doesn't make a difference. Even though, and I use this example very intentionally because circumcision is one of the medical things that we do to babies that has no real medical reason. And it has a lot of possible consequences and risks. And it's the first time sex and violence are associated in a man's life. The most sensitive part of the human male body is the foreskin of the penis. And when that's removed, and it's always forcible because you have to squeeze it and you have to compress it and you have to cut it, uh, there is trauma. And this, it doesn't matter. What I wanted to say right now is that babies are conscious and yet immature. And so when you see a baby trying to communicate, and it does this vocally, and it does this through its language of its body. It's trying to learn Martian. <laughs> it's trying to learn a whole new language. It's trying to get control over this wobbly thing called a body. This is why now researchers know it takes about eight seconds when you say something to a baby for it to organize its body. Respond. <laughs> You know, da, da, da. and instead we tend to flood babies with too much. So we go, hi, how are you? I'm so glad to see you, mommy. Just got back from work and it's going to be so much fun because I've been missing you for 10 hours. It's like, what did you say? <laughs> if we just slow down when we communicate with our own body and slow down to the pace of a baby, we'd all be a heck of a lot better in modern, stressful life anyway.
babies have a core sense of trust and resilience. They don't have to learn trust. We used to think babies had to learn trust like it was their first task. No, they don't have to learn it. They're born trusting to a huge degree. And that's even if they were a product of a rape. What happens is we betray their trust and we betray the trust in many ways. Simply by not recognizing them, by not tuning ourselves to them, but not making an effort to listen, by not picking up a baby when it's crying. Because, of course, one of the myths of many societies is you shouldn't pick up a baby when it cries. You should let it, quote, cry itself out because it will just dominate your world. Now, many religions and many philosophies believe, have believed, for centuries that babies are by nature bad and you have to break their will. You have to break their spirit. You have to not spoil them. And you'll hear this in a lot of cultures even today. You're gonna to pick that baby up every time it cries, you're gonna spoil, it's gonna run your life. You know, you cannot spoil a baby under the age of year and a half. And discipline is of no value. What a baby needs, a baby needs to get. And you know how that feels because if your partner who you love dearly, whom you love dearly comes home at the end of the day cranky, tired, cup half full, exhausted, just wants to get zone out and you've been exhausted all day by whatever you've done, your job, being a mother, all of it. And, uh, and you get irritated because of the way he behaves. And he says to you, when you stop complaining, maybe I'll give you a hug. If you stop crying, maybe I'll, maybe I'll look you in the eyes and say, I love you. It's like, I don't think you'd stay with that guy too long or that woman. You mean I have to be on good behavior before you love me? This is how most of us were raised. It has to do with shaming, and that shaming can come from parents, grandparents, school, religion. You're not good enough unless you behave a certain way. To a baby, the world is there to meet its needs, and when that happens, babies are happy, and they're comfortable in their bodies, and they're comfortable as toddlers. And in a separate class, I'm going to be talking about the unique vulnerability of boys. And boys are more vulnerable, believe it or not, than girls, biologically. But I'll save that for another class. Childhood is a, a recent phenomenon. It's a period of time accorded to a child to grow and develop. And it's based in play. And it's based in mimicking, following its models. Because that's how a human being wires its brain and develops every one of the systems that it needs to develop. It's model-based. And so it's going to unfold each part of the brain from this part to this part to this part to the you know, higher thinking function in order. Biologically, it will do that even if it didn't get its needs met. But what it will mean is that it's going to be on a very unstable foundation if its very core needs for being held and fed and kept warm and loved and nourished and rocked weren't met. Instead of this ancient brain, and on that, the emotional brain, and sitting on that, the cognitive brain, and then the prefrontal neocortex, which is this exquisite ability to discern and make logical decisions. So what we have, of course, is a lot of people really addicted to computers and other things whose minds may be brilliant, but they're sitting on a very fear-based ancient brain. They didn't get enough of their needs met. They don't trust well. They don't communicate well, and um, they would rather relate to a machine. Does that make sense? I think we all know ourselves even. We have patterns like that. There's three things I still want to mention.
One is that babies can experience trauma just as adults can. And trauma is something that I want to define for us because it's really a simple word that's misunderstood. It's not adversity. We all have adversity. If we're really resilient, then we're less likely for adverse experiences to affect us negatively. But resiliency has come part we're born with, in part we learn, in part gets taken away by these little betrayals of trust. So trauma is anything that overwhelms an organism so it cannot respond appropriately. That's it. So it can't fight, flee, or freeze, or whatever it has to do to resolve. There are all kinds of things that help babies who've had traumatic conceptions, times in the womb, birth, especially breastfeeding, skin to skin, and I don't mean just wearing babies, I mean naked front to naked front, which grows the brain, immune system, gut, even if the baby has been born very prematurely or by cesarean or had lots of adverse things prior to the first months afterward, simply skin to skin, six, three to six hours a day does amazing healing and neurological and other development. So that's breastfeeding, skin to skin, and then co-sleeping. In fact, the research from Sweden and other countries show more babies die from not sleeping near their parents when they're infants than from sleeping next to. They don't have to bed share even. Just within three feet of the human heart means it's in resonance. A baby's heart is modeling itself after the adult heart and the beat to beat variability, which we didn't see until we had sophisticated electrocardiography and you know machines that really showed between the beats, which is called beat-to-beat -beat variability. We didn't see that when a baby is taken away from its primary caretaker after birth, and actually as long as it's breastfeeding for quite a while, it goes into a state of chaos in terms of its beat-to-beat -beat variability. That's stressful for a baby and it's stressful for its mom. So when babies cry, often they're crying because they're not happy. They're crying because they're trying to tell us what's going on, and it's up to us to figure out what they're trying to communicate. And how do we do that? By holding, by rocking, by skin to skin, by breastfeeding, by eye contact, and being present. Being what's called in tune. It's also called attunement. Attunement is like, I don't know why you're crying. I can't figure it out yet. I know you're trying to tell me something, and I really want to know what it is. I'm going to try this, and tell me if it doesn't work, and then we'll try something else. But being attuned means listening deeply and doing your best. I'm sorry, honey, I realize that's not what you wanted. That's what... It is in relationship. It's a negotiation. It's not being a perfect parent. So the little things we do with babies have the most impact. Now, this is other than keeping them warm, dry, safe, feeding them, giving them enough rocking, that vestibular motion, which helps grow the brain circuitry. The little things we do. The little things we do are how we diaper a baby how we pick up a baby when it's crying, how we lay a baby down, how we wash a baby, but particularly how we wash its genitals. 
Very sensitive area. So anybody who, when a baby poops and changes the diaper, regularly says, oh, stinky poo. What message is that giving to a human being? We'll say how we pick up a baby, diaper a baby, feed a baby, tenderly or not, looking at our cell phone as we, and I often see this on airplanes, shove a bottle into a baby's mouth as we're having a conversation with someone's out. I mean, literally shove a bottle into the baby's mouth. And where's the relationship there? It's because parents are so busy. It's because they're so stressed. It's because nobody told them. And it's because nobody did it for them because we will tend to do what was done to us. These patterns go on in families. So I'm really interested in babies and brains and bonding because the glue of it all is attachment. How connected are we? Were we betrayed early on? Did we primarily get trust? Did our brain grow in a state of full development or was it in a state of defense because the cells of the brain perceived that it was a hostile environment. Hostile because someone was smoking, hostile because of the starvation of the mother during wartime, whatever. So it's a lot. And there's so much more that we could say about babies and about bonding and about the human brain. But I want to mainly get you curious. I want to get you curious about your life. I want to get you curious about every baby that you see. And I want to give you a couple of quick tips. And the tips I'm going to give you today are you might want to become a detective of your own life and your family and the patterns that shaped you. And if you were adopted and you don't know what your biology was, it's in your body. So if you write with your opposite hand when you wake up in the morning, you can probably access it. Your body remembers. Become a detective. The second is start questioning everything we're doing, including everything you're doing. It's like... Is this, am I really doing what my gut is telling me to do? What that little still small voice is asking me to do? Or am I doing it because this is how I was raised to think and believe? And how does it feel? The third is to practice breathing because so many of us didn't get to take full breaths when we were first born. We had tubes and blades and things, bulb syringes stuck in our mouths. And we didn't get to go, ah! What a great life this is. I'm so glad to be here. Many of us had drugs on board. So breathing and connecting in our bodies is number three. Become a detective. Question. Breathe. And the final thing is the hardest of all, which is practice self-forgiveness and forgiveness of those who raised you because they were doing the best they could given what they had. And this should remind us of the human potential to grow, to heal, to become more aware, more conscious. Hi, what's your name? Uh, I'm Samantha. And Samantha, how old are you? I'm 19 and I'm heading into college soon. Wow. What's your question or thought? Uh, I'm not adopted, but I have a close friend of mine that is adopted. And I'm curious about how it affects a child if they're not with the mother that they're in the womb of. Right, yeah. right, right. I'm really glad you brought that up. I'm going to give a very quick answer, so it's obviously superficial. <laughs> Adoption is a wound because there's always a relinquishment and the expectation of a baby growing in the womb is that it will be cared for by the person in whose womb it grows, whose heartbeat he or she feels and is in resonance with. It's always a wound, it's always a trauma, and babies respond to it differently depending on the amount of innate resilience they have, their willingness and ability to trust again, and the kinds of people in whose hands they are placed. But it is a lifelong issue. Thank you for asking that question. What's your name? My name is Lexis. Lexis. How old are you? And I'm 24. Okay. Are you a mom? No. I'm All right. Um, it was just simply um, 
It wasn't necessarily a question. I just know that through my experiences, um, I see how the traumas get passed down, down through generations. And um, okay. uh, through my experience, I just really resonated with that. What was the pattern in, in your family for how they respond, parents responded to it? Oh, in regards to um, basically rejecting you if you weren't acting a certain way. If, yeah. yeah. Alice Miller wrote very poignantly about this, a psychiatrist from Switzerland, called The Drama of the Gifted Child. Uh, the bright, sensitive child who has to please the parent in order to be loved. Um, the narcissistic parent who is thinking only of herself. And many families have this pattern. If you behave the right way, I will pick you up. Mm -hmm. If you stop crying, I will love you. Does that make sense now that you've heard what I said? Especially when crying is a form of communication. So can I imagine that you either rebel at that and can't stand completing things or that you have to be perfect? It was the perfectionism, definitely. And, yeah. and there's a wound there. Yeah. There's pain. I mean, I can see it in, in your face. Yeah, my mother was a perfectionist. She was the older daughter in a family of two deaf parents. And so she had to communicate to the world for them and she had to be good she had to be perfect she had to be the you know and she passed that right on to me and i had i was the easy kid <laughs> and so i i the other two were hard for various reasons and um i always was watching her because children are always watching their parents i had a therapist once tell me that you know when i came rushing into the office down the stairs and leaving my little two-year-old to try and find her way down the stairs because i didn't have a babysitter that day he said to me, excuse me, uh, isn't that Molly back there? <laughs> and I, oh yeah, come on Molly. <laughs> and he, he, he said to me that babies and young children have nothing to do except watch you and model after you and read you. That's what they're spending their time doing. And that's how they're growing. So it's not to feel embarrassed about the way we behave it is to understand and name some of the things that are still patterns in our lives that we really don't feel comfortable with mm -hmm. and having named it whew, perfectionism then you can do something about it i hope that makes sense yeah, yeah. it is a deep wound mm -hmm. because it's really saying i'm not good enough and your name hi um, my name's amarin amarin yeah hi Did you as a new mom, I have a three and a half year old and a nine month old Sonia. What are some tips for parents to sort of stop that pattern from continuing? Because um, I think reflexively a lot, especially with my three and a half year old, you know, like when he's not behaving the way that I want him to, right. how can I respond to him in a way that doesn't tell him or communicate to him that um, right. you're being bad, so I, you know, shape up or, or I'm going to ignore you? Yeah. You know, so I think that's just really a natural thing to fall back on. And it is. The natural thing to fall back on is our, how we react in wounds, from wounds. Not how we respond thoughtfully, but how do we react when we're not able to take a breath and think. So the first thing I want to say is it's really hard being a parent today. We are not meant to parent in isolation. We're not to meant to be left alone with kids for long hours a day. Kids are not meant to be indoors all the day. And we're meant to parent kids in a circle, in tribes, in little villages. Having said that, kids get the worst of us and they get the best of us. And the problem with single parenting and double parenting or just two parent families, if we're lucky to have them, is that kids get the worst as well as the best. They don't get grandma Ellie over here and uncle so-and-so here who lives just across the street. And if mom's looking at me with daggers, then I'm going over there. <laughs> or if what smells good in the kitchen here, I'm going there, you know. Um, it's a real problem in the isolated nuclear family. Now, having said that, the two practices that I would suggest that nobody taught me, and I wish I'd known raising my daughter, was the first thing to stop, close my eyes a bit, 
and take a good breath. Whew. And then to look at this person who I wasn't seeing as a person, I was seeing as she's out to get me. <laughs> Like when she couldn't get the seatbelt working in the back seat of the car and I was going across the bridge and she had to have it on and I started to flip out. Um, it's called giving from a half full cup. And many parents are giving from a half full or nearly drained empty cup. So what can you do to fill yourself? In that moment, first thing is take a breath. That does fill you. Fill your feet. Second thing is probably to tell the truth. God, do I feel pissed right now, and I don't want to behave that way, Sarah. I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm feeling really frustrated right now. It's not about you. That, if someone had just told me that, I could talk to my daughter in the womb, that I could talk to my toddler, I thought if I didn't tell her what I was feeling, she wouldn't feel it. If I didn't tell her I was depressed or anxious, she wouldn't know. But she knew, of course. So that's the other thing is you tell the truth and you name it. Whoa, honey, what you're doing right now is really frustrating to me. Just a second. Okay, let's, let's talk about it. Can we sit down on the floor? Or when things were really bad with my daughter, I'd get on my hands and knees. I was so angry as a single mom on welfare. A lot of the time I would just say, let's just play lion on the floor. And I'd face her, she'd face me, and I'd go, Rrr! And then she'd go, Rrr! and we'd yell at each other. And it was a big help. And the rituals in tribal societies often were just like this. There were actually ceremonial practices they did to discharge rage and frustration in the group. Because, of course, it could cause the group to explode. So there would be a drumming circle and there'd be a call to a ritual and the ritual would be rage. And the couples would sit back to back in Burkina Faso among the Dagara people, for example. And they'd start shouting at each other anything that was on their mind that they'd been carrying, but they would not be looking into each other's face and shouting at each other's heart. And when they got all done and there was nothing else to shout at, meanwhile, all the couples around the village are doing the same thing and the pitch is getting louder and louder. When they got all done and the it's kind of naturally quieted, the part of the ritual that I really love is they turn around, face each other, and wash each other's body. Again, what can I say? That's pretty sophisticated psychologically. So some of the things that you'll want to do, you can pick up from other people. Some just involve slowing down. Oh, Sarah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I hope that helps. Yeah, that helps. <laughs> and My name is Jackie, and I wanted to comment on the word trust and how important that is. I also wanted to, um, in any relationship, but I wanted to relate a story about my sister who um, was born in 1960 and uh, what I remember as a six-year-old at the time was that my mother had been told um, in her last trimester that because of their non-technical instruments, they were not able to tell her if my sister was alive or dead. That she would just have to wait until she went into labor mm -hmm. and then they would be able to tell. Well, this is how my sister grew up in that womb. And I will say from day one, she was a, um, a child and then a young adult who had many different issues with addictions, with mental illness, until one day she took her own life at the age of 28. And because of my field being in early childhood and special ed, you know, it didn't, it took me, I think I was like 34 when it happened, but it, it took me a couple years of analyzing why did that happen to her? And it didn't happen to me and it didn't happen to my brother. That's, I think, all I could come up with was that she, that, my poor sister never had a chance. I don't think she did. She, my mother yeah. was told by her doctor um, not to ever, you know, conceive again. But because my father was Catholic, he told my mother not to take birth control, and she had her, you know, she had my sister after having two miscarriages. 
shame on my father for not saying okay. So I want to point out a couple things there. There's usually not just one trauma or insult that leads to suicide. That's a forced pregnancy. Second of all, your sister came into a womb following two deaths. My hunch is because of the religious and cultural background that existed and right up till today, she was not told to name those babies she miscarried or to grieve over them. She, so she had a womb that was grieving. And she came into a grieving womb and then she had an ambivalent pregnancy because your mom didn't know whether she could allow herself to love this baby who was coming or not. So in her case, she probably distanced herself to protect herself from the pain of another loss. And that kind of experience repeated over and over again in one's life, but also starting as a, I'm going to say this again, that kind of experience sets a pattern. Now, if that pattern is replicated in other things in toddlerhood or later in life, it becomes a very deep set wound. And if it's never addressed and named, it can't really be healed. And having a brother who committed suicide as a, a brilliant scientist, but I know his perinatal background. I know what my mother went through in pregnancy and I know why. And I know the doctor told my mother not to breastfeed. She said, Eleanor, you're a school teacher, not a cow, and don't pick him up when he cries. And uh, Anyway, that was the way pediatricians talked to women in those days. And I know what he got from my father, who was a PTSD war vet, and who brought it all home, because we bring war home to our families. And I'm really glad to be saying this now. Children are the canaries in the coal mine of war. And we bring the traumas of war that men and women experience right home into the family. So people say, oh, well, it, she turned out fine. Jackie's fine. Her brother's fine. You know, they had the same parents, but they didn't have the same womb life. They may not have had the same conception. For one, it may have been an unwanted conception. For another, a forced conception. For another, a really wanted one. We all grow up with our own environmental influences, and they shape our genes. And I will talk more about that later, but bravo for you in working with young children to have picked up the cues and understand this. Because if we understand the patterns in our family that are dysfunctional, we can break them. What's your name? Casey. Casey. I'm 21. Uh, at the expense of being terse with my comment, I just wanted to let you know that I'm fascinated with the research you've conducted and that you've presented, and I really appreciate all your effort and everything that you've done, and thank you. You find some of it new, or? Yeah, it a good chunk of it I would consider new. And I just want to say thank you for presenting it to me. You're very welcome. Was there any stuff that felt like, oh, wow, I kind of know that? Maybe. However, I would have used different words, perhaps, and maybe a lot of that knowledge would have been more on the side of into like emotion, feelings, as yeah. opposed to words. So, That's, yeah. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. That's the original uh, knowledge or knowing. It's our body knowing. It's when we get chills. It's when our eyes start to tear up. It's when our gut gets tight. That's the that's the knowing you can trust when you can't trust anything else. That, and I'll do a whole class on our body. Thank you very much. So thank you for being with me today, and I hope I've made you curious.